Bible study. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, a very uh, silent portion of the Word of God, a portion of the Bible that even the Jews today uh, have gone out of their way uh, <clears throat> in certain facets of the Word of God to uh, change. And uh, we'll get into that, and hopefully we have time to do that. But Judges chapter number 7, in verse 7, it says, And there was a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said unto his mother, The eleven hundred shekels of silver that were taken from thee, about which thou cursed, and spakest also in mine ears, Behold, the silver is with me, I took it. His mother said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. When he had restored the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, therefore, I will restore it unto thee. Yet he restored the money unto his mother, and his mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the founder who made thereof a graven image and a molten image, and they were in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had a house of gods and made an ephod and a teraphim and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. In those days there was no king in Israel but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So if you were to uh, be reading uh, the book of Judges and you have made your way through the first 16 chapters of the book of Judges, you're going to immediately note how you have crossed the Judges. You have gone through the 12 judges, you've ended with Samson and the incredible story that Samson is. And you've kind of been walking, as it were, on a paved road, if I can put it that way. And uh, as you continue to read and you go from chapter 16 and you move into chapter 17, almost imperceptibly, you begin to realize that you're no longer walking on a paved path any longer, but you're now walking on what's really an untraveled road. The paving is gone. Now it's just this crunchy gravel, overgrown weeds, all of this overgrown shrubs, all, all these dynamics. And what you begin to realize is, I'm not in the same book anymore as I was in the first 16 chapters. To put this in perspective, chapters 17 through 21 of the book of Judges, there are four times in those chapters that you are going to find this uh, refrain that is used, although it's a little bit different in variation. And the refrain that's there in 17 and 6 18 and 1, 19 and 1, and 21 and 25, is that there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was pleasing in his own eyes. Now, what is different here versus the rest of the book of Judges? you got to understand that the primary uh, thing about the book of Judges is that while we do have Deborahs and we do have Gideons and we do have Shamgars and we have some uh, very mighty uh, judges that God rose up to deliver the people, you have to understand that really the book of Judges follows an overall tra trajectory that goes downward. So while there appears to be high moments in the times of the book of Judges, while it may appear that the judges that are brought onto the scene bring a sense of revival and a sense of, of, of turning back to God, 
the overall trajectory of the book is not one that goes up, but it's one that goes down. And so, of course, when you finally get through the pages and the pathway of, of Samson, Samson's a highly celebrated judge. He, uh, he has a lot of stories, and we spend a lot of time talking about him. But his end is a very destructive end. It's a very tragic end. He is blinded. His eyes have been plucked out. He has been separated from his covenant anointing with God because of giving in to Delilah. And a lot of people don't realize this about, about that story, but Delilah is not the one that cuts his hair. It is a servant in the house that Delilah, once he goes to sleep, she charges the servant to do the deed that would take his power. That is important because even the very woman that deceived him wasn't the one that would take his power from him, but it would be the lowest servant within her own household that would be known to have been the one to take that mighty anointed Samson's power. I think the enemy is very, very particular in, in, in its PR it's public relations. I think it likes to let everybody know that it was something little that did in the mighty. And I think it was very, very particular that Delilah had a servant cut his hair, and she herself did not. It was a statement being made. But the end of Samson's very uh, tragic, and a blind man tied between the pillars, being mocked at and ridiculed, asked God one more time, God, bestow on me strength once more, anoint me once more. And of course, we know that he broke the pillars and the house fell down upon those that were in that place. And from that point, you move, as I said, from this seemingly paved path, this, this road that you can feel the solidity of the ups and the downs, but now you enter into this very bizarre, this very uh, vivid, this very disconnected, disjointed uh, part of the book of Judges. Now, it's important, as I said, to mention that they were living in a time that every man did which was right in his own eyes. And we have to remember that Proverbs tells us that there is a way that seemeth right to man but the end thereof is destruction. The Bible also says, lean not upon thy own understandings, but in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. That is talking about the self-governance of a people that are under the lordship of Jesus Christ. That is about the self-governance of not having to wake up in the morning and deciding and dictating for your own life what you think is right and what you think is wrong. We are not the arbiters or the deciders of what is true and what, and, and what is good. To kind of put that in perspective, what I just said, that we are not the arbiters of what is good or true. Go back to Genesis where Eve was standing in front of the tree. What was the moment that was deciding for humanity? It was when she became an arbiter, a decider, a judger of that which was good in her own eyes. For what did she do? She looked at the tree. And when Eve saw that the, that the tree was good for food and pleasant to the eyes, she took of the tree eight of the tree, and of course, the rest is history. But look at what happens. God, every day of creation, was making the fundamental point. At the end of every day of creation, God said, did he not? It is good. 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 And at the end of it all, he said, it is good. Very good. So what was God proclaiming? What was He establishing? He was letting us know that He is the arbiter, the decider, the, 
the, the judger of that which is considered good. The problem is, is when man begins to assume the role of being the arbiter of what is true and good, that's when we start getting things completely messed up in our lives. So when you get to this story and you get off the path of the rest of the book of Judges, every man is doing what is pleasing or good in his own eyes. Anytime that man becomes the arbiter of goodness, we know how that ends. The Bible said that in the last days, men are going to call evil good and good evil. Again, I could talk a lot about being arbiters of good and arbiters of truth and deciders and judges of that which is pure and good. But if you give mankind the ability without godly leadership to make that decision on his own, it's going to result in, 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 in absolute broken anarchy in the lives of men and women. And that is exactly what chapter 17 through chapter 21 of the book of Judges does. Why is the, 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 the book so drastically different? Because there's no leadership. And now Samson is gone. There is no more judge that emerges. And it's a period and a time where there is absolutely no leadership that is found among the people of God. And I want to put this in perspective. And I want to make this clear to anybody that thinks that we can live for God without decisive, apostolic, God-ordained authority is making the mistake of our lives. I don't ever want to become the one that decides in my own mind, in my own life, what is good or pleasing or right or wrong. God gave me a Bible. And he gave me a pastor and he gave me a church that holds to the standard of that which is good and pleasing in the eyes of God. And so when you turn to this chapter, the trajectory is down. The anarchy, the absolute, uh, the absolute frivolity of the people of God following the lack of leadership again. There's a vacuum of leadership. Now, I want to take you on this biblical journey starting in chapter 17 and kind of bring us into this story and uh, help us understand a few things that maybe we've never seen before. So when you open up the story, here's how the story begins. There was a man from the hill country of Ephraim. His name was Micah. He tells his mother, uh, the 1,100 weight of silver that had been stolen from you, that you had cursed the thief that took it from you. I want you to know, Mom, that I'm the one that actually took it. And uh, you told me in my hearing that the silver uh, that was taken, I'm going to curse the thief, but Mom, it was me. And when the mother hears that he's the thief, uh, again, the home is broken. Again, leadership, the vacuum of godly leadership is going to manifest in the home. And I'm going to tell you, I see this going on today. But she tells him, well, you know what? I had been saving that money for you anyways. And so she says, may you be blessed by Yahweh, my son. There's no justice. There's no rightness. There's, there's at this time, there's, there's no sense of, of discipline there. Again, this is, this is the anarchist dream where a son can steal, admit to his mother he stole it, and then mother say, blessed are you of God, and uh, you can have it. So he gives his money back to the mom, and his mother says, I've definitely set apart this silver to God from me for my son. Listen to this. To make a carved idol and a molten image. I've been saving this for my son to make a carved image and a molten image. So she looks at her son and says, let me give it back to you. So Micah 
takes the silver, gives it to the silversmith, and he makes it into a carved idol, a molten image. The Bible said it was in the house of Micah. This man, and this is a very important thing to note, it tells us in verse number 5 of 17, the man Micah had a house of gods and made an ephod and a teraphim and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. (laughs) I don't know if you see the irony of what is happening right here in this moment, but it is important to understand that when you go to Deuteronomy chapter number 27, the Bible said that you're not to make a molten calf or a or an image, or any of those idols. And it talks about how severe it was to actually do something like that. So to put this in perspective for everybody that is listening tonight, we we have in but just a few generations, from the time of Moses, where if you were to fashion an idol, it was done in secret, it was done in the darkness, We've now come to the point where mothers are encouraging their sons to give silver to the silversmith, make an idol in the open, and guess what? When they do it, by those neighbors around him, it is regarded as pious. It's regarded as good. He had a house of gods. The Bible said that he makes his own house of God, ordains out of his own family, his own priest. He makes an ephod, which is, of course, we know what they would communicate and get answers from the true God. And all of this is being celebrated by the people that are around him. How do you reach this point the history of the people of God, how do you get to the point where you can blatantly, in the open, make false gods, create a house of gods, create an alternative ephod, create an alternative priesthood, and it be venerated by your neighbors as being something that is pure and righteous and religious? It's very simple. It goes to tell us after this happens, in those days there was no king in Israel. In other words, while we know that God had not ordained a king to be set in place, there was no divine leadership. There wasn't a pastor. There wasn't a man of God. There wasn't somebody that was standing there reminding them of their commitment to the things of God. And I want to make this clear, and I'm going to say this very, very, you know, not even carefully. I'm just going to say it because I think it needs to be said. Beware those of us that think that we can just casually miss church on a regular basis for no reason at all. Beware, because the timeline of living life without divine leadership and the church fulfilling the role that God put in our lives, God forbid. Are you hearing me right now? God forbid that we start to allow ourselves to go that direction. And so they build this idol. And just when you think that this story is getting a little bit Weird, you've got to remember that at the end of chapter 18 and 31, it tells us that there is a house of God in Shiloh. Put that in perspective. And there's a lot that I've got to cover here. So you've got here Micah and his house of God with his alternative ephod and his alternative priest and his silver image cast in the fires of the silversmith. And in Shiloh, there's the true house of God. So what's going on in this story? There's a subtle idea that's being presented here. Number one, 
there's a contrast here at the beginning and the end of the narrative that there's the house of gods with Micah and the house of God at Shiloh. What is the scriptural writer trying to tell us? There's a false and a true. And they're being cast against the other in this story. One place, you've got the authorized place where God is to meet with man. And then as one commentator said, you've got Micah's house of God, which is really nothing more than a collection of cultic tinker toys. But that is what man does without divine leadership in his life. Secondly, when you look at the depiction of the characters, you can scarcely fail to detect there's an undercurrent of mild contempt towards the main actors of the story. There's Micah's mother who reverses a solemn curse with a fresh blessing. How convenient. She consecrates the returned wealth to God and gives it to illegitimate worship at the same time. We bless you with this, God. Now we're going to build an idol and violate the word of God with what we've just said we bless you with. Micah, contrary to his name, what does Micah mean? It means who is like Yahweh. He manages to reduce Yahweh's incomparability to a few mundane pieces of silver hardware. The Levite. What, 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 what Levite? Glad you asked me. You got all this weird stuff going on. And in verse number 7 of Chapter 17, it says there was a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite. Everybody say he was an authorized priest. (laughs) He sojourned there, and the man departed out of the city of Bethlehem to sojourn wherever he could find a place. And he came to Mount Ephraim, to the house of Micah. And Micah said, "Where, where are you coming from? And he said unto him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah, and I go to sojourn where I may find a place. Remember, the Levites didn't have uh, an inheritance of land. They they depended upon the help of the tribes to survive. And Micah said to him, tell you what, why don't you dwell with me and be unto me a father and a priest, and I will give thee ten shekels of silver by the year, a suit of apparel, and thy victuals, your food. So the Levite went in. And the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man was unto him as one of his sons. And Micah consecrated the Levite and was in the house of Micah. Then said Micah, Now I know that the Lord will do me good, seeing I have a Levite to be my priest. I don't even know at this point whether to cry or laugh or beat my head against a concrete wall. I I don't know what to do when I read this story. This is like Alice in Wonderland. It's going through little small doors and eating little pieces of cake that make you too big, but then having to eat something else that makes you too small. And then everything not making sense and Cheshire cats that disappear and can talk and cards with queen's faces that are saying off with your head. I really feel like when I read this, I have dived into the story of Alice in Wonderland. Here's this guy. His mother, I mean, again, I don't want to repeat it all, but he's got this house of gods. He's got this fake system of worship going on. He's a thief, but he is blessed for giving it back and admitting he's a thief and the money that he takes back as a thief goes to the silversmith to build a false god he's got the house of tinker toys which is really all that he's got and there's a true house of worship in shiloh but now there's a levite a genuine authorized agent of god he's a part of the bloodline he he comes from 
the tribe of Judah. He's got a right to be in Shiloh. But Levite is wandering. Again, direct correlation between the, the lack of divine leadership, even those with callings on their lives will wander without divine leadership. Now he's got a Levite there, and he says, hey, be a dad to me. I'll pay you every year. And then I'm going to consecrate you as the priest. And now, I mean, have we, got, have we come that far from Deuteronomy that we have forgotten that it's a sin to make molten calves and images and silver? And, and now because you've got a real priest, now you say, hey, because I, I've got, hey, I've got all this other false stuff. You know what this tells me? It tells me that when he consecrates his son to be a priest, he knows that it's not the true thing. But now that he's got the true thing, he says, you know what? God's going to bless me now because I got a true priest with me. I know it doesn't make any sense. We want to take a step back and say, it's a compromising priest. It's a hireling. None of this makes any sense. Oh, but it just gets worse. Chapter 18, now we're not, we're so far from a paved path. We're, 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 we're moving into quicksand. Look at what it tells us again. In those days, there was no king in Israel. And in those days, the tribe of the Danites sought them an inheritance to dwell in. For unto that day, all their inheritance had not fallen under them among the tribes of Israel. Now, all of a sudden, you got the Danites. They've migrated up north because at the very beginning of the book, they failed to secure most of their land. And while the whole book of Judges is going on, some ancient commentators think that this story happened at the beginning. I, I don't necessarily think so. They're wandering and, and looking for land. The children of Dan send from their family uh, five men to search the land. And as they're searching, guess where they go? <laughs> Boy, this is, uh, this is the place to be, the house of Micah. So here we are again. We're back in the weird house of Micah, who lives with his mother. His mother's a little bit crazy. <laughs> and he's got a real Levite living there. And the real Levite, is get paid every year. Micah thinks that this is going to give him blessings from God. He's got this house of gods. He's got these cultic objects and rituals. And now these wandering Danites, five of them, lodge in the house of Micah. Look at verse number three. When they were, when they were by the house of Micah, they knew the voice of the young man, the Levite. And they turned hither and said unto him, Whoa, man, small world. We know you. Hey, what brought you here, Levi? And what made you uh, in this place? And what hast thou here? And he said unto them, Thus and thus dealeth Mike with me, and he hath hired me, and I'm his priest. Anybody a little bit blown away by this story so far? And so they tell him, they say, uh, Hey, we would really uh, ask, counsel of you of God that we may know whether our way which we go shall prosper so you got wandering Danites again what's wandering indicative of the lack of leadership you've got a Levite not doing what he's supposed to do you got Danites wandering all over the world trying to find land and find inheritance you got a lot of people wandering and they're all coming to Micah's house. <laughs> Don't think for a moment, hear me, that the devil won't find you an alternative when you don't have divine leadership. Notice how their paths are all coming to the alternative. They're coming to a place of compromise. They're coming to a house of gods that is false. They're coming to an Alice in Wonderland bizarre place. This is how you get Jim Joneses and Kool-Aid in Botswana. 
in Ghana. This is how you get weird cultic leaders that say, hey, the aliens are now here. We need to drink Kool-Aid and poison now is all together and we need to die as one. It's when people don't have a decisive leadership in their life that is telling them the truth. That is how you end up wandering into the house of Micah. And uh, I, when I started getting into this, I thought to myself, God, how do I cover all this ground? And I'll tell you, what I felt the most is we've got to avoid the house of Micah. The world is always going to give you an alternative. It's always going to try to give you something that replaces the real. And you get there, there's going to be somebody that says they hear from God. And guess what? You might even have a Levite, a priest. Somebody that's from the true truth that knows the apostolic doctrine that has been in an apostolic Holy Ghost filled church service and has felt the fire of God fall. And you're going to get there and say, man, I can still touch God here, but you're still going to be in the house of Micah and you're not going to be in the true house of God. I'm telling you, the world's going to have you a house of Micah. Oh, come on. Let's just say thank you, Lord, for the true church of God. Amen. And so the Bible said that they get there and, uh, And the priest says, go in peace before the Lord is your way we're in. Five men depart. And uh, and how they dwelt, quiet and secure. There was no magistrate in the land. (laughs) Here we are again. There's no leader in the land that might put them to shame. And they were far from the Zidonians. They had no business. They came to their brethren. And they said, hey, guess what? We've beheld what's very good. And we're going to go possess the land. When you go, you're going to come to a people secure. Listen, there's a word that is coming out. And uh, there went uh, from the Danites. So you have this story of the Danites. Okay? And uh, you've got this, this, this uh, group of the Danites that are now Eshetal, 600 men appointed with weapons of war. Um, now they're going to go claim land. And guess where they go now? Anybody want to guess where they end up? Boy, this, this, this is quite the path. It says they passed thence Mount Ephraim and came to the house of Micah. Now men are going to war. They're going to go possess land. They're wandering men. They don't know where they're going. They just said it looks good. Who again? Who's the arbiter of good? Remember, God told them what was going to be theirs. Why are they looking for land? Why are they looking for something that's good? God told them in the beginning of this all what they were going to inherit, and they failed to inherit it. But again, here's what the lack of leadership will bring in our lives. And so they came to Micah's house, and five men that went to spy out the country said to their brethren, Hey, you know that there is in this house an ephod and a teraphim and a graven image and a molten image? Now consider what you have to do. And they turned and came to the house of the young man, the Levite, to the house of Micah. Now you got 500, you got 600 men that are gathered outside the house of Micah. And the 600 men appointed with their weapons of war stood by the entering of the gate. And the five men leaves that 600 and they go in. Look at what it says. And they took the graven image and the ephod and the teraphim and the molten image. And the priest stood in the entering of the gate, the 600 men that were appointed with war. And they went to Micah's house. They fetched the carved image, the ephod, the teraphim, and the molten image. Then said the priest, what are you doing? What are you doing? You're you're taking Micah's stuff. I don't know if you are reading this story and thinking this is bizarre. And they said unto him, hold your peace, lay thine hand upon thy mouth, come with us. (laughs) Now they want to get their own thing. Now Micah's been replaced. Micah was the, he was the reservoir for falsity. He was the reservoir because again, that's what the devil will do. It's always going to look for something mightier, but it'll take the weakest weirdest house to start something in but when it has an opportunity to breed to bigger numbers oh it's going to try to get out of that place and it said uh they look at the priest and they say hey why don't you come with us come to the house of be the priest uh, why would you rather be a priest to one man why don't you be a priest unto a tribe and a family in israel i mean isn't that your calling old levite and the priest's heart was glad (laughs) look at this He takes the ephod. So what? It was made by Micah. It's a fake. 
but he takes it anyways. I hope you understand what's going on here. They are enamored with their falsehood. They're enamored with their false religion. They're enamored with their, with their, with their similarity to the real. And I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to walk into churches today that, that have the ephod and the teraphim and the graven image, and they have somebody that somewhere in their life heard from God. Look, it's not enough to say, I've heard from God. You better be living for God and hearing from Him in the present. But again, they're enamored with the false. That's what this world is. They're enamored with the false. This is what happens when there's not divine leadership in our lives. And so they turned and departed and put the little ones and the cattle in the carriage. When they were a good way from the house of Micah. Everybody get this in your mind. They've got Micah's ephod. They've got Micah's priest. They've got Micah's teraphim. They've got Micah's stuff. His little house of gods has been plundered. How ironic. The thief that steals the silver that would be returned to make the God. Now the thief has been thieved by others that have taken his God. He's got a house of gods that no longer has gods. He's got a house that's just an empty, vagrant place where, where, where nothing good can ever happen. And the Bible said, look at this. And when they were gathered together, they overtook Dan. Uh, the men that were in the houses near Micah's gathered together and they overtook the children. They cried unto the children of Dan. They turned their faces and they said to Micah, What ailest thee? Thou that comest with such company. Look at what Micah says. Here's this sniveling, snarling, impotent little man. This is a weird man. He says, You've taken away my gods, which I made, and the priest, and you have gone away. And what have I more? And what is this you say to me? What aileth thee? They've taken it all. What do you mean what's wrong with me? I woke up this morning and when I went down to my little house of, of, of alternative worship, everything was gone. My priest was gone. And the children of Dan, look what they say, verse 25. Let not thy voice be heard among us, lest angry fellows run upon thee and thou lose thy life. The children of Dan went their way. And when Micah saw they were too strong for him, <laughs> that weak, sniveling thief who thought that he was big enough to take and build himself something for God, went back into his meager little house of God's. And they took the things which Micah had made, the priests which he had, and they came to Laish, to a people who were quiet, and they destroyed them with the sword, and they built a city. They called the name of the city Dan after the name of the Dan. Look at verse number 30. You ready? The children of Israel set up the graven image. And now, <laughs> this story decides to give us another twist. I wish I had 15 weeks to teach on these whole things. You ever wondered who the Levite was? Have you wondered who the unknown man was, that Levite that shows up that's willing to be hired? This is where the Jews today have tried to change his name in their sacred writings. The children of Dan set up the graven image. Verse number 30 of chapter 18. And Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan on the day of the captivity of the land. And they set up Micah's graven image, which he had made all the time. The house of God was in Shiloh. You've been paying attention to this weird, false religion. This bizarre outline of stupidity. This abounding theological broadside and all these little innuendos that are trying to set up a cult that's alternative, that might have some of the same objects of veneration, some of the same sacramentalism as the original, and yet it's, it's surrounded by, for no better words, weirdness. It's just surrounded by weirdness. It's surrounded by a story that is really just an anarchy of actions. Nobody's really got a plan. Everybody's just acting spontaneously. Everybody's just doing at that moment what seems right to them. 
You're dominated by this man named Micah. And then you have this tragic, tragic reality. The fact that suddenly, out of the middle of nowhere, the Danites come. They're wandering. It's just a bunch of wandering. New Testament talks about wandering stars who foam. They're clouds without rain. <laughs> I'm to tell you, everything I read in this story is so uh, spiritually indicative of the hour that we're living in. I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of weirdness with religion. There's a lot of weirdness today. Everybody's spiritual. Everybody's got a, an insight to God. There's a lot of houses of Micah scattered throughout our region. I drove by the other day. There is a house on the way to West Lynn that is rented by seven different uh, facilities. And on the side of the, of, the, of the door is a sign that is inviting you to the church. One of the churches that rents the building where they have cannabis dancing and worship. And I thought to myself as I drove by, what bizarre things would ever cause somebody to think that that was anywhere near what the Word of God has to say. What could cause somebody to get so cultically weird and so messed up in their mind that they could think that it's pleasing to God and this book that we all read to have a church that is centered around intimate dancing between members while they smoke marijuana and they meditate to gain access to a higher power. I uh, have driven by churches even on McLaughlin Boulevard that proclaim to be people of the Spirit and uh, even some of our very people that God has thankfully brought out of those churches have come to truth. They've come to Shiloh. They've come to where the real is. They've come to where truth resides and where there is divine appointed leadership that has spiritual authority, not some semblance of trying to create a picture of what authority looks like. But they have been, and there is on this road and street, there are churches where the whole church service is hijacked by these arcane, bizarre, cultic growlings and, 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 and meditations and hums and, and uh, trying to uh, appear as though we are caught in the ecstasy of heaven by the sounds that we're making. All that really is, is the house of Micah. And what I have found is that without leadership, people will come by the droves and they will visit these places for a while. And they will get so messed up with the weirdness of it. that When they do come to a true place and they do come to a true church, truth is too grounding. They can't submit to the groundedness of the true house of God. They, they, they're not comfortable in a church service where, where there's order. There's order in the midst of spontaneity of the Spirit. It doesn't make sense to them. The Spirit to them is chaotic. It's, it's random. It's, it's barking like a dog and hissing like a snake and rolling on the floor and, and making grotesque figures with your body. That is what the Spirit has become to so many people in this world that, that proclaim to have a relationship with God. But all they've got is a, is, is a life that is void of divine leadership. And they are sacrificing everything that is pure and holy. And they're, 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 they've, got, they've got Micah's mother. And they've got Micah's house of God. And they've got, a, they've got an ephod that says it can talk to God. And they've got a Levite that's had an encounter with God somewhere. But it's not enough. The Bible said them that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And somebody said amen. Amen. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. I, I know that this is uh, a little bit more esoteric is the word. This is... Uh, 
a little bit deeper than I normally like to go. And, and some of you might be missing this, but I'm, I'm trying to tie together the weirdness of, of, a, of a people. These are the people of God. These are uh, people that should have known better. And yet they've embraced false religion. They have embraced things. And in the middle of all of this, we are dragged to the reality that one of the descendants, the grandsons of Moses himself, is the Levite that had gone into the house of Micah. He's the son of Gershom. Who's the son of Gershom? I know it says in there the son of Manasseh, but it's been proven that that is not Manasseh. It's actually meant to be Moses, and they tried to change the name. Because even the Jews today cannot even correlate in their mind how a grandson of the great Moses, the lawgiver, could be hired in that house of optical mirrors to become something that he was never meant to be. I'll tell you how you can become uh, a grandson of the greatest preacher that has ever lived. I'll tell you how you can become somebody that's got connections that go back to the hewn rocks that, that carved out the commandments in our lives. Is All you've got to do is have a period of time without divine leadership in our lives. Amen. And so there is this idea of what is called... Uh, raw syncretism and what i'm meaning by that it, it is a a blending of pieces of the real with everything else that is smoke and mirrors and i'm going to tell you right now we have no shortage of bizarreness no shortage of superstitious weird religious cultic ideas that somewhere along the way they may have touched on the real but if you don't have divine leadership that helps you frame that truth oh let me say that again if you don't have divine leadership that helps you put a box and frame that truth in and you've got nothing more than the anarchy of ideas ideas that 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 are like amoebas that just that just move in the given direction that light appears to be in that's all they serve for. They have no brain. They, they have no uh, comprehension of where they're going. They're just led by animal instinct and animal appetite. And I'm afraid that people that don't have divine leadership are wandering stars, like the Bible said, that their own destruction is ahead of them because a star that wanders is soon on a collision course because it's out of the gravitational alignment that God put it in. You know why the earth is so successful in our rotation? It's because we are serving the leadership of the sun. That is the absolute truth. We have a gravitational pull that as we move around the sun and the planetary uh, uh, objects beside us and around us, they carry their orbital uh, sequence that was put in them by God. What is the center of all of that and the gravity that they have? It's a divine sun that sits there and burns like an orb that no man can approach. But we are held to the order of that sun ship, if I can put it that way. And I hope you understand my meaning. The life that isn't held by the gravitational force of God that wanders and ebbs and flows and is, is like the waters on the tides where it gets a little too high and it, it just flows over the walls. That's devastation and destruction. I am... I'm closing. Uh, the difference between a river and a swamp is a river has boundaries. I'm going to say that again. The difference between a river and a swamp is a river has boundaries. We call them the banks. They are, they are restraints. They are walls. They are, as it were, opposing forces that take all that mighty river that started somewhere from just a few little drops at a source and because it meandered to a confined boundary, it gained a mighty tempest that is known for the Mississippi and the Colorado 
and the Columbia rivers and all the great rivers of the world, you only have a great river if it is submitted to its banks and it is submitted to the divine leadership of a channel that time has carved out. But a swamp's not that way. A swamp doesn't have the banks. A swamp is this murky, mediocre, putrid, dark water that holds all the, all the snakes and the, and the copperheads and the crocodiles and the, and the, and the death-giving mosquitoes of life. It's, it's, it's just something that doesn't have boundaries in it. It just wanders and roams. And we like to go visit those places because it is so odd to rivers it's so odd to the world around us it's it's the everglades is a is is a tourist attraction because there's something about the stink uh, and something about the danger and something about the spreading murkiness of the swamp and the everglades that just appeals to us because you want to know why because it's not normal it's something that is not like anything else beware people in churches that are swampy that don't have boundaries, that don't have leadership. My God, beware the house of Micah. Beware the wandering souls that come and tell you, we have found it. We have found a man that will tell us good things. That is what they liked about that Levite. That is why the Danites stole all of Micah's little tinker toys. And took him and brought him in their house. I want you to get that through their, your mind. That's all church is without truth. It's just tinker toys. It's just Legos. It's just play things. It's just getting together and having a little tea party with somebody else and saying, hey, you want to play with me today? You want to go outside and play? You want to you pull out the tinker toys and the Lincoln Logs and let's build something. That's what a church is that doesn't have truth, that doesn't have leadership, that will stand upon definitive boundaries and say, you know what? We don't go here. And we don't do this. And we live a certain way. And we talk a certain way. And yeah, we believe in modesty. And we believe in holiness. And we believe in abstaining from the things of the world. You want to know why? Because we're not going to be the house of Micah. We're going to be the place that when you come in, it's going to be the divine manifestation of the Holy Ghost that sets down in the house of God. And people's lives are shook by it. Oh, that's what I want. That's what we're going to have. But no... When you balk against leadership, when you fight against God-ordained structure, what you're asking for is you're asking for a plastic foundation. You're asking for something that's rubber. You're asking for something that yields and bends to pressure. You're asking something that is conforming. You, you, you want something that you can press your hand into like memory foam. And you want to conform it to your will and your desires. God's church isn't memory foam. It's built on rock that's unmovable, that's enduring, that, that no world, no thing, nothing could ever replace it, nothing could ever destroy it, nothing could ever get rid of it. But the world is being enamored, enamored by Micah's, the weirdness. You think that's weird? You think that's weird? Then you go into the reality of when they are trajecting downhill. You go into the chapter, the 19th chapter, where a Benjamite Levite, where a Levite comes and he has a concubine and he goes to a city and the city wants to take, wants to take him, just like Sodom and Gomorrah. Again, we're in the Alice of Wonder, Wonderland of the lack of leadership. Bizarre things happen. Monstrous things are born. Things you never thought would take place in the people of God take place. And he gives his concubine to the sadistic pleasures of a sodomistic, sodom, sodomistic society. And they leave her and when he opens the door in the morning to go on his way. They find her on the threshold of their door, dead. And he cuts her up into 12 pieces. And you read that and you hear that and you say, oh my goodness, that is terrible. That, is, that shouldn't be in the Bible. No, it shouldn't. No, it shouldn't. But why is it there? It's written there for you and me to understand 
that if there's not divine leadership and the church isn't doing what it's supposed to do, there are things that are horrible and tragic that happen in life. We're looking at a world that is caught in the plights of vicious sin. And you turn on the news every day. The stories you read here, our world is desensitized against them because this kind of stuff happens every single day. You want to know why? Because there's no divine leadership. The world has ceased to gravitate around the central pole of our divine God. You want to know what happens when God gets involved in your life? Order out of chaos emerges. He showed us that in Genesis chapter number one. But when a world no longer submits to the creative divine pull of the gravity of God's power and presence in their lives, nothing but weirdness can emerge. Nothing but the trajectory of downward can emerge. Blackness and darkness and the arbiters that say evil is good and good is evil. And we now have come to the place where Harvard is telling us but you know what? They may have an attraction to children, but it doesn't mean that they're bad. We have come that far, folks. Why? Because weirdness is bred without divine leadership. So what are we going to do with all of this? What are we going to do with all that I've taught? What are we going to do with everything that I've said? Somewhere along the way, you've got to make a transition to where you recognize that the weirdness of life and the weirdness and the breaches of things that bring us to that terrible reality is that we're doing things that are right in our own eyes. So we've got to first understand and we've got to observe our own lives and we've got to say, God, am I in submission? And am I subjected to divine leadership? God, am I in the place that you've intended for me to be? Am I consistent with what you've called me to be? Am I living my life? after the pattern of that which is true. Because I'm going to tell you right now, there's always going to be an alternative that's going to pull on you, which we've got to make up our mind. I'm going to live for God. He's going to be the sonship of my life. The orbit of my day is going to be Him. I have no time to stop by the house of Micah because I'm revolving around the house of God. I'm revolving around Him in worship. I'm revolving around Him in my, in my commitments. I'm revolving around Him in my thought patterns. I'm revolving around Him everything in my life. There is a divine pull and a draw to Him and the sonship and the lordship in my life. Amen. Let's stand wherever you are. I want us to collectively right now bind together in prayer. I want us to ask God to help us. Lord, I want to thank you for the word of God tonight. God, I want to thank you for the authority, the power, the divine touch of your spirit that has moved into this place. God, I'm praying right now that the orbit of our lives would be around the magnetic pull towards the order and the power and the divine things that can only come through alignment with the kingdom of God. Lord, I don't ever want to find myself in the house of Micah. I don't ever want to find myself in the alternative, living false things that are not true, but have just an inkling and a, and a slight, slight uh, uh, flavor of what the real is. Help us, God, as we move forward. Touch us, guide us, and lead us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, Amen. All right, Sunday, remember to be with us. Remember we're going to be here. Let there be a gravitational pull to the house of God. God bless you. Have a good night.